Well, welcome to Real Estate Unplugged. My name is Greg Cohen, and I'm a real estate advisor at Cressa. I created this podcast because I felt there was so much to learn from senior corporate real estate professionals that can be passed on to future generations and to those that aspire to have those roles. So with me today is Gig Kadiga. Gig, as we like to do at the beginning of every episode, would you kindly introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, before I get, I introduce myself uh, uh, more in detail. I just want to say that what I, my opinions, my expressions, my experiences are my own. They do not reflect the company for which I work for. So uh, just want to make sure that's clear for everybody. And uh, well, I'm Gig Kadiga. I'm the uh, uh, original uh, real estate director for my company that I work with. And I've been with the company for 16 years. I've been with uh, McKesson Corporation, Blue Shield of, of California, uh, been a broker, been uh, a housing broker, and been a gopher for a developer. So I've done a lot of different things uh, throughout my, my life. So I'm uh, very excited by, uh, and fortunate by my, my pathway. And so when you started, what year was it that you started in commercial real estate? And what were you doing at that point? Well, I think it starts really before commercial real estate. Uh, you know, when you get out of college, what do you do? So I worked with a developer in an Alameda in a marina and helped made, uh, you know, assess the capacity of the estuary, which Alameda is an island. Uh, there's estuary for additional boat docks. And so I helped develop, I quote, develop that site. I wouldn't say I really uh, more than influencing it with a study. Uh, and that matriculated into what my next job was going to be, which is to work as an asset manager with the Equitable. And uh, that was a great experience. Or by, you know, I, I assessed uh, all Northwest portion of uh, of the United States for the Equitable property management, asset management. And uh, interestingly enough, uh, in those days, uh, I actually created a computer analysis or uh, a f- model that would do, if you believe very simply, uh, a actual budget variance it, today that's done so easily, but it was such effort at those times using the codes that we had to use. So that was pretty cool stuff to do. From there, uh, when went into a, a decided I'd want to get into a, a, a different form of real estate. So I got into brokerage at that time. And that's where my commercial, I guess, my active commercial, commercial sales, site selection, marketing, negotiations and that type of stuff started uh, enhancing enhancing along the way. And I would have to say that along the way, I've taken courses like uh, uh, Drucker's, uh, you know, sales force, uh, you know, how to sell, uh, reading books on that stuff. And that's very helpful. It gives you clues. It doesn't necessarily mean it's always operable, but it's clues that you need to do. Smoke out the, smoke out the objections and get to the answer uh, type of thing. And uh, as a broker, I was, uh, reasonably unsuccessful. And so I decided that <laughs> that uh, uh, a friend of mine was walking the hallway, said there's an opening at uh, McKesson Corporation. So I had called John Delaney, who is a great guy and retired now uh, from McKesson. And he and I talked and I got hired for that position and stayed there for about 11 years. Wow. So working their real estate across the United States, warehousing, uh, mega centers. It was like the first consolidation of warehousing at that time um, and did uh, you know, a couple, I think, interesting things there whereby one I liked was the equity lease deal where you structure a, a lease with equity by using the tenant improvement allowance that the landlord provides as your equity portion. Hmm. Now, um, that could be good news and could be bad news. So there's goods and bads and all that, but it worked out pretty well for us at the end of the day. Um, from there, I... Uh, Got laid off by a, a, a because we were consult, consolidating under a third party vendor, and so um, there was really no position for me, which made sense. So I went out in the brokerage uh, world again to mm. figure out what I you know, what I want to do, and I really believed in um, the, the um, customer service platform, the full not real estate brokerage necessary, but a full platform, and try to bring in elements of people that had new construction and new uh, space planning and new, all these other things uh, that then I could act as a customer focal point for those assets or resources that they needed to 
to pull together to build out their space. Or, and was that was that novel at that time to be sort of to create a, a, a resource to be a one one stop shop, if you will, for to pull all of those people together? Actually, very much. So there are a lot of people trying to do it, but it was all smoke and mirrors. I mean, really, it was. In fact, I actually had a a, a coordinate party at an Italian place on, on Columbus Boulevard. Uh, and it, the whole theme was smoke and mirrors because, mm-hmm. every, you know, it's just people pretended they did it. Now, today, obviously, it's full service. It's right where it should be. It's doing the right thing. I'm, and, I'm pleased about that. Um, another thing, I guess, well, let me go on through that. So then from there, after working that, as I said, I was fairly unsuccessful as a real estate broker. Um, you know, the deal is you can come in second, but second doesn't count. And so after a while, um, and I found that I couldn't convince, and I didn't know that I wanted to convince people that they needed to make the deal. And so I, you know, I felt maybe that wasn't my strength to be in. You were a, glutton, a little bit of a glutton for punishment because you went back for a second time. Yeah. Yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah. You know, well, I thought maybe I had a different model and unfortunately the model that where I went, uh, they kind of supported it. I thought they were pretty advanced, but it really wasn't as much as what I wanted to do. And so I uh, uh, continued with uh, in the brokerage, got out of that worked for uh, actually went to work doing uh, a, uh, I won't say my own business, but somebody had uh, asked me to take over their business. And uh, I took over the consulting business and actually did pretty well for a while. But uh, they also got consolidated or absorbed and my client went away. And that when you lose your you know, big gorilla, then you're kind of short of uh, of uh, capital and resources and that type of stuff. So uh, unfortunately, I had to uh, move out of that strategy and into uh, I got a call to uh, manage the data center for Bank of America. And, uh, and it was a great job, great people. Um, it was a difficult time because it was really kind of the first time that uh, facility management came into service, meaning that B of A really kind of took a leap at that time. What years would that be? Probably the 90s, I guess, late 90s. Um, and the customer wasn't really, the local customer really wasn't happy about being, quote, replaced. Like I was replaced at McKesson. They were being replaced and they were not happy with it and they struggled with it for a long time. It was kind of an adversarial. Uh, relationship. Um, eventually, I pulled out of there. Uh, a friend of mine interviewed with uh, Blue Shield of Americans uh, of California and uh, said, you know, that job's not for me, but it is for you. So I I went over there, took a look and uh, got hired there and ran, and converted their real estate department to the uh, workplace strategies department. Again, trying to bring in the elements of a total strategy as opposed to just brokerage or transaction. Was it something that they weren't aware of at the time? What what, what was it, or what what didn't they know that uh, that created that opportunity? Well, because they really didn't have any strategists. They didn't have anybody to pull it all together. So um, uh, we did a a seven year strategy uh, on their assets, and uh, you know, consult. There's like you know the implementate. There's a, a incremental strategy, and there's a consolidation strategy, and uh, and so. You kind of have to figure out which way to go. Sometimes it's not right to step out of your incremental strategy yet because you haven't got enough base or volume to work with, meaning that you don't have enough square footage to consolidate to a single location. So you're better off in two locations or three locations. But at a certain point in time, it may make sense. It doesn't always uh, make, make sense to consolidate into a, a single location for services and minimum, you know, efficiencies, those type of things. And so uh, we did that on uh, one, two, three call centers for um, uh, Blue Shield, um, all very, very exciting uh, projects in my, my opinion. Uh, and one's in Reading, one's in uh, uh, El Dorado Hills. The other one was in uh, uh, Lodi, California. Uh, so th- that was kind of what we did. But in LA, we didn't do that. So there's it's, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, so from there, um, what what I did at uh, Blue Shield was they never took on debt uh, very much. They were pretty conservative. Uh, so a project that that we did in El Dorado Hills, uh, we consolidated eight buildings into a single two hundred fifty thousand square foot call center, uh, and we had a choice there to um, either just shave off the knoll 
there's a you know a hillside, shave it off and build on that. But we chose not to do that. We I, I just couldn't bring myself to shaving to cutting the hillside down. Mm. And so and neither could he, the, the team. We all agreed to this wasn't just me. And so what we ended up doing was we built uh, four buildings around the uh, like a pearl necklace around it. And it was I had great views and et cetera like that. Uh, um, you talked about mistakes that were made. Uh, I had hired a, an architecture firm, which I really like. I still respect them. Uh, but uh, I believe you should only go to the board once with a project because it becomes very really, uh, credibility issues if you go to the board too many times or, or again. Now, there's times to do that, obviously. But after they programmed the whole place out, we got the square footage, we got the price to build out, and we went to the board, got approval to go forward. We ended up uh, uh, having to have uh, not enough space for everybody. Mm. And I said, that's can't, that can't happen. You did all the programming. And instead of having like 30, 50,000 square feet of excess space, we had negative uh, 60,000 square feet. Wow. First time I ever had to fire somebody I really didn't, I hated to do. Uh, I don't like to do that. I really trust people and I know that things happen and you have to address them. And that doesn't necessarily mean you need to fire them, but that was a pretty impactive uh, situation. It really was a heart- heartbreaking. It was, was heartbreaking the, for me to do. Was there growth that wasn't incorporated into, uh, into no, the estimates? It was all, no, it was all, it was all there. Right. It was mm-hmm. all there. I, I don't I don't know why I don't know how it happened, uh, but it it did happen. Did. I said I'm not I'm not going back. So we got another architect who uh, designed an exterior staircase uh, that helped open up space in the center for more productive use, and uh, we were able to uh, make that work. Uh, the interesting part about that this is in Sacramento, and it was south facing near the air conditioning inside. You put glass staircases, which were beautiful, to walk up and see the view as you go up, up the stairs. The problem is the temperature changed with cracks in the glass. And it kept busting. If there was one fallibility or flaw in that glass, it shattered. Mm. Uh, we finally got resolve on it, but it was a lot of effort to do. So uh, things happen, and you just keep after it. So, uh, you know, you just keep, have to keep plowing away and trying to find solutions. and. And not giving up on it, so we and did. Isn't, and isn't that one? Isn't that one of, the, one of the wonderful things about the industry that how dynamic each situation is, and and how uh, there are so many problems to solve, and and no no two no two deals, no two um, locations, no two leases are the same. Oh, absolutely! It's why I, I I love this thing for two things. One, just what you said, the variety of of challenges. The other thing, the relationships. Uh, there are great people in this industry. I mean, I mean, there's some really tough people, but there's some really great people in this industry. And I've uh, uh, I've really enjoyed everyone I've met. I've enjoyed the fact that I've traveled to the United States uh, and a little bit over Europe and, and uh, nothing to Asia. But to me, that was a good experience. I would never have done it otherwise. So uh, for me, it, it was a very, very good thing. Relationship building, meeting people and the challenge of the variety. That's but- why I love it. But then Blue Cross came to an end. Yeah, so um, I finished the uh, the seven year uh, strategy on it, and all I was going to do. And I'm not really into maintaining assets. And uh, there was a period of time where they were just going to maintain their assets, which made sense to do. You know, they had their call center set up, and they're going to do their thing. So there wasn't much for 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 what I like to have done. So uh, I. Have, when it interviewed at uh, uh, Genentech and and uh, eventually got that job there, and I've uh, been working there for about fifteen years now. And what was the role that you had, had applied for? I applied for um, a senior manager role at the time. Uh, when I called up to accept the job, and they were telling me I had the job, uh, my boss, who was a director at the time, uh, said uh, on the phone, "I'm going to quit." In <laughs> I'm going to quit. His boss was on the phone, so it wasn't like he was hiding it. I'm going to uh, be leaving in you know three months, so uh, so uh, um, it's going to be just you. I'm going, Gee, what's what's this all about? But it worked out. It was a great experience. Uh, I'm glad I did it. And how big was that company then versus it where it is now? 
And well, I mean, self wise, I can't tell you. But was it, it a it, was it a was it a was it an emerging uh, company fifteen years ago, or was it? Um, um, you know, were you taking a, a leap of faith? No, I don't think so. I think they 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 had just gone through a major growth period uh, in seventy four to seventy eight. I think it was when I got there it was probably uh, in two th- in the two thousands. They had just grown uh, another time uh, in the late nineteen hundreds, I guess, or nineteen eighty and nineteen nineties. And so uh, when I got there, they were they were they knew what they needed to do. So. Uh, they were ongoing viable leader, you know, leader in the industry. Uh, so it was the right company to go to. And uh, then about three years later, they were acquired by Roche formerly. And we went over to being a Roche company. And we are as a part of the Roche group today. And um, and can you speak to uh, to any exciting, um, interesting projects that, that, that you experienced in the last 15 years within within that organization? Everything's been kind of exciting with them. Uh, we did a uh, major location in uh, New York City for uh, one of our teams where we ended up at the uh, Alexandria Learning Center at, uh, I think, on 2nd and 29th, if I remember correctly, somewhere around there, uh, which was a brand new bio life science, uh, quote, three building cluster. Uh, and it was, uh, it was strange to go there, but it was interesting how uh, we looked at the major, like, uh, uh, East Coast Boston. We looked at uh, John Hopkins, and we looked at uh, New York and uh, New Jersey, and it's surprising how well the stats showed for what we were looking for, which was in the learning institutions, hospitals, uh, clinical hospitals were pretty. There was a good amount of those in New York City, so it did justify a position there. Mm. So uh, we did look. We did locate there. We have subsequently closed down the operation for various reasons. Uh, uh, you know, reorganizations, that type of stuff. But um, that was an interesting one uh, to do for, for one. We closed down a site in Nutley, which was very complicated because it had a lot of uh, waste issues. So we're working and addressing those things. Uh, and we got, we're got we working with all the right appropriate and we're completing that that, that operation. But uh, that that was a, a kind of an interesting transaction because interviewing uh, developers for that and identifying which ones we want to work with and working with the city. It was actually split between two cities, uh, Clifton and Netley. So we had like two cities we had to deal with. We had some sewer issues, you know, all the normal stuff that you have. Uh, and uh, I haven't been back there to see how successful it is, but I think it's probably been very successful. So uh, that was an interesting aspect on the East Coast side. You know, they're just they're just all kind of exciting stuff. I mean, mergers, acquisitions. Well, so 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 you say that and uh, and to people who are listening to this um, after this very established uh, long career doing multiple roles within real estate. What uh, I don't want to ask a top three, but what would you say some of the, the biggest lessons learned are? Uh, for well, you. I think that I think a, one lesson is getting involved in like IAMC or Cornet and uh, uh, taking their courses and and learning from from those courses and from those people in those contacts. That's very I think that's that's one thing I really encourage every time I talk to somebody if they want to be in, in corporate real estate, uh, whether you're a member of Cornet or not, you can still take the classes. And uh, you'll meet great people. And uh, it's all about the networking, as you know, at the end of the day. What other lessons learned? You have to be as, I think, relationships, building relationships. Because at the end of the day, and not everybody works with a handshake, but uh, I believe you can do a handshake deal where somebody's, uh, somebody will perform and you know they can and they know they will. Uh, I'm trying to think of the company I work with in uh, in uh, Memphis, Tennessee. They own the Peabody uh, Hotel, which was great. They were just renovated with, with the Ducks. Yeah, with the Ducks, <laughs> and that family was fabulous. I shook a hand with them, and they I was flying out the next day, and they were already starting to clear my 20 acres. Those are the type of people I love working with. Uh, Bill uh, Rouse was like that too. He was, you know, you could trust what he said to. It was uh, Jim Mazeroski, I think, was his uh, partner there. And just great people. Just great people. I mean, I, 
I'd say today, Alexandria and Boston Properties and uh, BMR and um, Kilroy, uh, locally Kilroy, uh, I've been very, very good. Uh, Health Peak would be the other one that I, these people are just really solid people. And uh, now they've earned trust with me. They understand where I'm coming from. I've earned trust from them. They, I know where they're coming from. We're not trying to be adversarial. We're trying to achieve a goal. And we, we, we know that their success is, you know, if you're trying to be, I want it all on my plate. One of my bosses said, if you don't leave some money on the table, then you're not going to have a happy situation. You want, to, you want everyone to feel like they're winning. You want to feel like everybody is winning. And there are trade-offs. And you don't always win every point. But you're a partner in this. Right. If you're not playing partnership, then you're going to have a problem because the landlord, you got to work with. You know, I, I got a problem. I don't care if you have a problem or not. You know, it, you got to work together. I think the other thing I learned and just brought brought up to mind is that don't screw your vendors. One of my CFOs wanted me to uh, go back to my vendors and keep cutting them back and cutting them back. I said to the person, I said, listen, if you keep cutting them back, when there's a disaster, they're not going to show up for you. You got to be fair about it. And I think that's a key element. So I'm going to roll that into the next level around brokerage fees. I know this hits you deeply in the heart. So I, I appreciate that. But in the 80s, I wrote a paper for uh, NACOR, now Cornet, about uh, uh, floor and ceiling, whereby I believe that uh, a broker should have a floor because I did brokerage business. I ran with this assignment for McKesson for like three years and it never happened. And I spent hours and hours doing it. Never got paid for for the transaction. I'm not offended by that. That's the business model, right? I don't like that business model, honestly. Uh, I think it's disincentive uh, for the, uh, for the industry. But uh, a floor and ceiling, I think there's, uh, you know, you should pay them for at least get them gas money and food mm-hmm. money, mm-hmm. you know, whatever that floor is. But I also don't think somebody should be making thirteen million dollars off of the deal. Mm-hmm. I just. I just don't think that's a fair number I, for what it, when they do the same effort for a small project as well as for a large project. Now it's not necessarily that easy. I get it, but um, I do think there's a, a challenger in the industry to change or, and they're not going to because they're making good money now, but I think there should be a kind of a flat fee for services, honestly. The, and so uh, that was actually one of the highest uh, read papers of Cornet at that time in the eighties. Well, I was pretty proud of that. I'm sure. Anything I write, people read. I can't believe it. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, and just because I'm I'm watching the time um, for for someone who is um, looking to 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 work in the industry, um, when you are hiring, um, when sitting in the perspective of somebody who is going to hire uh, people either laterally or, or to move in um, advice that you can offer them um, as they, as they approach the, uh, the interview process or perhaps um, uh, moving, you know, moving, moving within the industry. Yeah, no, it's, it's variable. Honestly, I've seen people come into the corporate real estate, the role to architects, engineering, finance, um, um, uh, procurement, uh, different ways that they come into the game. And it depends on the company that you're working with and how that happens. Uh, I think it's important to have a good financial understanding of what takes place. I think you you need to know the basics around real estate and s- gain some experience in that. Uh, my first job out of college was being a gopher. Go for this, go for that. Paint paint this wall, paint this sign, uh, go up on the roof, tar the roof, uh, you know, clear the gutters, you know, do stuff. Don't be... Don't be uh, just get in the game. And if you can get in the game, you do you do well. So I think you do well. Like I like I said, I've enjoyed it. And, you know, but have humility, have humility just, you know, to get involved and just do it and and have a, a little bit of a belief in the, the process. Yeah. Yeah. And and the experience. I don't know if, yeah. My family been in real estate since 1932. So it was kind of embedded in me, ingrained in me or part of me to go into uh, my DNA, to use a funny term, uh, for going into real estate. And so uh, I love the stuff. Uh, I can remember, though, that my mom and dad didn't have ice cream, and I knew it was a bad season. In what uh, role within real estate was the family? Uh, a residential, uh, local community type of thing. 
there in there in California. In California, yeah, right. in my hometown where I live now, where I'm a third generation. So, and I saw uh, just doing a little bit of uh, research um, that you're that uh, you're involved in the local level in the government. Where I saw something with a, a YouTube video where you were running for some council seat. Yeah, I didn't make that seat. Right, but you, but you tried. But you're involved. Yeah, yeah, I tried. Yeah, no, you got to be involved. Well, Boys and Girls Club, you see that right there. I've yeah. been involved with that for probably 38 years. Uh, uh, Boy Scouts, liaison, Sea Scouts, uh, uh, other community stuff that I think you got. Uh, that's part of the fun too, you know. So you got to give. You got to give. Go oh, give back. I hate to use that kind of term, but participate. Get involved. Enjoy it. Right. It's multidimensional. It feels really good. And, uh, and, and you're part of your community. It's, it's connecting with your community and giving back to some, to a community that's given you so much. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, and we had the pleasure of, uh, of working together recently on, a, on a, a lease here in New York for your organization. Um, and at the bottom of your, uh, your email, there's the signature, there's a, there's an interesting phrase and I don't, I didn't know the genesis of it. So, you know, could you, could you share that? Yeah. So uh, Proverbs 15, one, I, I picked that up actually during my campaign because I felt that people are so angry and nasty about everything. And I didn't want to be that. That's not my, what I want to be. I, I, I want to be more of a collaborator and a, uh, you know, again, back to relationships. So uh, the, uh, the quote is a soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger and that'll happen. And that's not a good strategy. 99% of the time, sometimes you have to do it. I did learn a lesson whereby you have to learn to talk the community you're in. So if you go to New York from the West Coast, you got to learn to talk and understand that attitude. Uh, you, if you go to the South, you have to learn and talk that the, that relationship, that environment, that culture. Uh, in the West Coast, you have to do the same thing. In Europe, you have to do the same thing. So you've got to kind of understand the culture. I'm not saying you have to study it. You just got to learn how to communicate it. Well, I'm smi I'm smiling because I was at an uh, at a an event last night, and the comment came came up. You know, so many people say, "Do unto others as you would like done unto you," but yeah. really, but maybe it's "Do unto others as they would like done unto them." So don't assume. I right, don't assume that how you want things done is the way that other people want want it done. Understand what they want done. Because you need to listen to them. You, you know, you need to no, understand their well, perspective. No, you're right on. If, if you don't understand their perspective, as you just said, you can't and you can't feel for why they're negotiating the position or why they're taking the stance. And again, it's understanding and again, working with one another as a partner. Right. Well, um, Gig, I can't thank you enough for taking the time to uh, to be on the podcast today. Uh, for all those listening at home. Um, if you if you like this and you have any comments, don't forget to to put them in the uh, in the comments and give us a review. Uh, this has been Greg Cohen. This is Real Estate Unplugged, and uh, we'll see you next time. All right. Cheers. Thank you all. Thank you.